Alan, for inviting me. And uh, just um, a few words of introduction, uh, since we haven't met. Uh, I am, my name is Aaron Alexander. I am the co-senior rabbi at Addis Israel Congregation in Washington, DC. Before this, I was the associate dean of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies for 10 years. Before that, uh, which was about a 15 year stint in Los Angeles, I studied in Jerusalem at the conservative yeshiva. I was one of the founders of Camp Ramad de Rome. Um, the reason I was at Camp Ramad de Rome is because I essentially grew up in two places, but the second of which was Boca Raton, Florida, where my dad still lives. And before that, uh, I was born into Northwest Indiana where I spent the first 13 years of my life. Uh, so I um, have sort of been around and through. Um, I, uh, I just, I, I was really honored to be asked to do something for the men's club. The last thing that happened to me um, before I left Los Angeles was I finally won one of these things. That was my Red Yamaka award. Um, this was from April 2015, so I keep this uh, near and dear to me, and um, I'm sure that was Rabbi Simon's doing all along, but for whatever reason, I'll, I, I, I was very honored, really honored to receive it. Um, I, I wanted to... The only thing I couldn't find was my red yarmulke to sort of hold with it, but there does exist a momentum of that night that is the right color. I, so I want to teach a text, but I also sort of want to um, then open it up. One in, in one of my capacities in the conservative movement is I've been on the law committee for several years and I'm the chair of the subcommittee on um, Kashrut, which was very relevant about a month and a half ago and gave me many sleepless nights, um, is no longer as relevant but um, there's a lot going on in that world. And so after I teach a little bit, I'm open that people want to ask any questions about what's happening there and what actually goes on there. <laughs> um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about that to the extent that people may find it interesting. I have a text that I want to share. I'm wondering if it's okay if I do this by sharing my screen. Will that work for everybody? Let me just find. While you're doing that, uh, did you say you were at Temple Emmanuel in Palm Beach? No, I was. Uh, I when we first moved to Boca, we were at Temple Bethel uh, in Boca Raton, which is a Reform temple. And then it was after I already, had already left for college, my my parents joined B'nai Torah. Oh yeah, um, I'm familiar with that. I just was that. Lunch and learn with Rabbi uh, with the Rabbi Engler there. Yeah. And then so, were you at Munster, Indiana, when you were up north? I was in Munster, and my rabbi uh, just actually passed away. Rabbi Rabbi Ostrovsky, who had been my rabbi growing up. Great, and the former great... Rabbi Sherman is now at Mariah here in uh, where my kids belong in Deerfield, Illinois. That's right. That's right. Oh, these connections, they just Small world. They don't ever get old. It really is. Right. All right. So I may this I, I, I call this text for our time. I'm going to make it as big as I can make it. Um, and there are texts that I, that I have come across uh, in my teaching over the years or my writing over the years that I think in particular speak to um, the condition of Jewish communities right now and our relationship in many ways um, with each other and with the master of the world. So there's two Talmudic texts here. We'll do the first one and then we'll see how we're doing. So this is this text is from Tractate Sota, Masechet Sota. And um, it will sound like it's coming out of nowhere, but it's not. Amar Ana Amar Rabbi Simlai. So Ana said that Rabbi Simlai says, in a synagogue that is made up of entirely priests, Beit Knesset Shekula Kohanim, everyone ascends to the platform to recite Birkat Kohanim. So in places where 
um, they did duchening, where, the, where at, during the Musaf service, uh, which happens in Israel now every day, and in some places in the diaspora on the Shalosh Regalim, on the pilgrimage holidays and the high holidays, uh, you know, the, the Kohanim go up and they do the Spock hand thing, the Tali Toder over their head, and they offer the congregation, Yevarecha Chadonai V'yishmarecha. So the rabbis of the Talmud would often ask hyperbolic, hypothetical questions in order to have conversations about larger values that can't be drawn out of what people see in normal daily life. So in daily life, you generally don't find entire congregations of priests, of Kohani. Not now and not then. However, if you raise the question, you get to have a conversation you wouldn't have otherwise had that you really want to have and you keep it textually based. So the synagogue that's entirely a priest, everyone's a said. And then it was clearly a setup for this question, Lamima Barchi. If everybody in the congregation is standing on the bima, facing all of the seats that are empty, who in fact is receiving Yivarecha It's a It is a reasonable question and it's an obvious question. And that's how you know sometimes the Talmud is carefully crafted. It's a work of art like a painting uh, and each layer is a different color of paint that the artist is, is adding in order to amplify certain voices. So who are they blessing for? For their brethren who are in the fields. Now, who are those people? This is like an obvious answer for the rabbis of the Talmud. But who are the people in the fields that are not there in shul to receive Birkat Kohanim. The answer is, I mean, we don't know the exact answer. Everybody else in the community that needs to work during the time of prayer, but can't actually get into the synagogue. And I want to just stop with this text right here for a second and um, allow us to sort of sometimes give the ancient rabbis more credit than they themselves were given in terms of the reality of Jewish life of their day, which was that in fact, it looked very similar to Jewish life in our day vis-a-vis -vis the insiders and the outsiders, or at least how people defined insiders and outsiders. One thing I love about the men's club in general nationally is it has totally transformed the conversation on insiders and outsiders in general such that insiders just becomes the norm for people, whether they find themselves on the inside of the walls or not. But the rabbis of the Talmud were keenly aware that there were times for which people decided or prioritized the feeding of their families over the being in the synagogue, whatever the ancient synagogue looked like. And the response here isn't to say yet, though we're going to get there, don't bless them. The response is all of that energy from the Kohanim is actually leaving the synagogue and going out to where people are doing their work. So now the Talmud, the, the whole thing is a setup for the next line, for each line is a setup for the next. Eni, the later strand of rabbis comes through. Eni, really, is that so? That's how this text works? But didn't, this is line C, didn't Abba, son of Minyamin Barchia, teach people who are standing behind the backs of priests are not included in the blessing? So here's the turn that just happened. Um, there's another teaching, apparently, and this is also the practice today, that you cannot stand behind the priests during the priestly blessing. So, and, so in a synagogue in which the bima is a little bit forward and there are seats maybe that go in the round behind it, if duchening is happening, the people who are behind the priests would actually walk out so they could be face to face with the priests, not face to face, their faces are covered, but you know what I mean, facing one another, such that they could receive the blessing. But what this text suggests is that you have to be in the same physical space as the priests. So this is the construction of the Talmud. Everybody duchens. Who are they duchening for? They're duchening for people a mile away working out in the fields. Wait a second. That's not how the priestly blessing works. The priestly blessing works with people in the same physical space. We know this because there's another text which suggests 
people behind the priests even don't count. Therefore, how could people a mile away count? And then the resolution comes. La kasha, the Talmud says. No, 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 no. This is not difficult. This is a case where people are compelled. That's where they aren't. Which is to say the people who can receive the blessing by not being in the same physical space are the ones who don't have as many choices as we may have initially thought they had as to whether they could be in shul. It is only if you go to shul and you're like, eh, I don't want the blessing, I'm going to go stand over here away, that you can't receive it. Which is to say, if there's no space even left in the synagogue and I have to stand behind the priests, my choices are constricted, I do receive the priestly blessing. I don't need to be in the same physical space. And the idea here, the Hebrew word is ones, in Aramaic, it's had anise, those who are um, constricted in their options. Uh, this is where the choice in Jewish law isn't what it is, let's say, um, uh, uh, it, it, with in the same way that we, un we understand it often with American liberty, which is to say, I don't always have every choice available to me such that I'm choosing between a myriad of options all the time. Sometimes when I wake up in the morning and I have to make the decision, go to work or go to shul, that's not actually a choice. I may be compelled into one of those decisions because the circumstances of my life have been laid out before me in such a way that I really have no other choice. And, you know, if you look at all of the early stories of immigration from Europe to the United States, where very observant people from small communities in Europe were coming to this country and working on Shabbat, because there's a whole body of literature that talks about observant Jews who needed to work on Shabbat because that was the only way they were going to get their family from one condition to the next or to a better condition. So it would, it would be like saying those people who are desperately trying to feed their families by working six or seven days a week um, are somehow not included in the communal prayer. Somehow God's blessing that is meant to flow through the priest does not flow out to those who have decided that their religious life demands they work in this particular moment. That's simply not how it works, the Talmud explains. <clears throat> this is what I meant at the beginning when I said the initial question of a synagogue made up of entire, entirely of priests is a setup for everything that follows. The rabbis wanted to teach about those who were compelled to make choices that not everybody else um, would make. And the rabbis wanted to make the point that you don't need to be in the synagogue to receive the blessings of the synagogue. And the rabbis wanted to make the point that it is the responsibility of the people in the synagogue and not the ones outside of it to bless and pray for people outside of it. That's counterintuitive to the way that we often talk about religious life. We often talk about religious life as, oh, you may, you're not here, so it's your responsibility to get it. No, if somebody isn't with us, it's our responsibility to figure out how it is we include them in our most important prayers. All right, I'm going to move to the second part of this. Rabbi, before you do, if I may. Please, please. When we may, I mean, isn't this the same thing as when we make our prayer for our country or the prayer for Israel, the prayer for uh, Mishabarach? I mean, the, the people that we're making it for are generally not in the building. Okay, I mean, they're, they're elsewhere. We've been doing that for years. Yes, and, 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 and not as long as they've been doing this, even, which, which now would be about 2,000 years. But I think, okay. that, I, I think that you're right. You know, at, at Addis Israel, we are actually doing it for the people in the synagogue. Um, that is what it means to have a, have a shul in Washington, D.C. In fact, many of them are in the room and regularly on Shabbos, uh, for, for at least for the prayer for our country, <laughs> our leaders right. and advisors. Um, but that's, that's sort of D.C.-centric. Uh, and, um, but it is every shul in DC. It's not just Addis. Uh, I, I certainly know from having visited the others, but you're absolutely right in terms of um, Israel. All right. Here we go. So this now is line E. But didn't Rav Shini of Berta de Shahore teach in a synagogue that is made up entirely of priests, some of them ascend and some of them answer amen. So now we're challenging the first line that all priests go up. We've got another teaching that suggests priests go up and say birkat kohanim and other priests say amen. 
So that's a difficulty. Why, how is it possible that everybody can go up and there can be others who are there responding amen if they are all priests? The two don't jive. La Kasha, no, 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 no. Let me explain to you. That is a case where 10 remain. This is where 10 don't remain, which is to say, if I have enough priests to have everybody duchening and still a minion in the, in the seats of 10, then they answer amen. If I can't have nine, 10 left over, then everybody comes up, so the majority is up on the bima. So it all depends on how many people are in the community. Back to the matter. Abba, son of Rav Binyamin Barchia said, the people who are standing behind the priests are not included in the blessing. So they want to go back and they want to explore this line. Back to the matter, and the Aramaic is gufa. And whenever I see the word gufa in the Talmud, I know that they're about to remind me of something that I probably skipped over without paying too much attention to, but needs to be addressed. And what needs to be addressed is that people who are behind the priests are not included in the blessing. That's a challenging assumption to make. So H, it is obvious that tall people standing in front of short people do not create a barrier. Common sense is about to kick in. The text suggests that we need to be seeing or at least capable of seeing one another to receive the blessing. But the later rabbis come in and say, come on, are you serious? That can't be true. Because what happens if there's a really tall person in front of a really short person, and now the short person does not actually have the capacity to have any direct line to the priests who are standing up on the bima. And they say a chest or an ark does not create a barrier. There could be like a, a, a you know, a, a bookshelf in my way. And that can't stop Birkat Kohanim from getting to me. But what about a wall? What about a wall? And then we get this famous line that pops up a few times in the Talmud. Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi Amar, Afilu mechitza shel barzel, eina mefaseket ben Yisrael avihem shebishamayim. Even an iron partition does not interpose between the Jewish people and their parent in heaven. Which is to say, if we are receiving Birkat Kohanim, or if Birkat Kohanim is being recited, there is no physical barrier or structure that can prevent God's holy words from however they assumed it was happening, because this isn't the priest giving the blessing, it is the priest channeling God's blessing. That blessing gets channeled and it can transcend anything. There is no physical barrier that can stop Yivarecha Chadonai Vishmarecha. And one of the reasons I think this is, it feels like such an important time for now is because this, you know, the technology that we are now existing with and frankly, to be honest, in, I feel like I'm in it half the time. I feel like I'm in a Zoom room and it's not a room and I know it's not a room and it's not the same as being in a room, but I still feel like somehow I'm inhabiting the software, which is very uncomfortable most of the time. Um, when it comes to sacred prayer, when it comes for each one of us to actually pray for on behalf of others, there is no wall. There is no wall. There is no distance that can halt the prayer in its tracks. Because if it could, if there was, it would make God small. It would make God small to suggest that a physical barrier was actually sturdy enough to stop the master of the world's love and compassion and blessing, which is what the priestly blessing is, from flowing to everybody who needs it, which by the way, now to everybody in the fields, all of us, a lot of the time, because none of us are on the inside anymore. That's one of the things that's changed about religious life is at least now, is that none of us are on the inside. There are no insiders and outsiders de facto because we are all coming from, it, it, I wanna say equal space, though it's not entirely equal, of our phones. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to ask if you have any reflections on this text uh, or um, anything you want to bring up or anything you want to ask about it or anything else. I'm going to I'm going to stop the share for a second so I can see you a little bit more clearly. Um, and I will share. I will also let me just do this.
so that you have it. I'm going to put in the chat here the link. This I, I uploaded this to our website, so you have a link there if you want to copy and paste it if you want to keep the text after too. Thank you. I, I have a question, Rabbi. When, when you were going through this section, it occurred to me that perhaps it's referring not to people who, and you even mentioned yourself, who, who are behind the uh, priest because they couldn't help themselves. Maybe it refers to people who choose to go behind the priest in, and not receive the blessing for whatever reason. Maybe they don't feel worthy. Maybe they don't believe. Uh, you know, it could be many different reasons. But maybe it's a matter of the choice of the participant as opposed to their accidental physical location. Um, I, I think that that's right. I think that that's true. I think that's the fundamental distinction that Talmud wants to, wants to make about the fact that physical barriers can't stop the prayer. The only thing that can stop the prayer is somebody who actually has a choice to turn away from it. And then we have to determine how to define actually has a choice. That's where the Talmud comes in counterintuitively, at least to what we would think we'd expect from the ancient rabbis and their holy communities. Um, but I think you're also right. I'm glad you brought up who doesn't think they're worthy because the person who doesn't think they're worthy and decides to go behind the priest may not have the same choice as the person who does think they are worthy and decides to go behind the priest, which is to say, it's gonna be situational to the individual. The person who doesn't feel that they're worthy of a blessing, I would claim probably has far fewer choices than many other people in the world once you start to delayer the life of that person and what they have experienced and what they are feeling. Um, so I actually think the question allows us to be more inclusive as of, of as many people as possible and, um, and reshapes our notion a little bit of free will, which is to say free will for the things that are actually possible. All right. I Thank have you. a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions. Yes. Number I'll... one, is it written anywhere where the, how the congregation is to face when they're being blessed by the priests? I know that in some congregations, they'll look forward at the priests, some look sideways, some turn around uh, the other uh, direction. And my second question is, is there something one says in response to the... Uh, to the blessing by the priest, because when we had Rabbi David Lincoln, who had an Orthodox background, he gave out a sheet that you're supposed to say some response when the Kohenim are talking, but all our conservative rabbis have never had a sheet or said you're supposed to respond uh, to the blessing at all. Um. Thank you. Good questions. To the first, the answer is the, the minhag, the tradition in almost every place that I have ever been in at Duchens, is that um, people do not look directly at the Kohani. So that could take shape in different ways. I've seen people turn around so that they don't even give themselves the option of seeing. Most people look down. Some people put their tali tote over their head. Um, there is nothing uh, in Jewish law that suggests it's prohibited, um, though it has become like an ayin hara, like a superstition that one shouldn't look directly at the priests. Um, to the second, amen, is the response. Keni Hiratzon became the antiphonal response in synagogues during the repetition, but amen is the response that will generally happen. Um, I don't know about conservative rabbis and sheets. I know that in most conservative synagogues, it still does not happen even in Shalosh Regalim. Um, in my congregation, we started with the ritual committee over the course of the year, studying whether or not we would bring it back um, in a way that felt right for the congregation, which is to say nobody could remember why we stopped doing it at Israel, in which case it was worth looking at whether or not trying it out would work for the congregation. And um, so I think most communities don't have a custom even of what is being said. And most of us uh, who studied in Jerusalem didn't experience it until we moved to Jerusalem. I had never seen Birkat Kohanim until I moved to Israel and, and, it, and I was part of it every single day, not even in my very conservative synagogue in Indiana, growing up in the 70s and 80s, did we do Birkat Kohanim on the high holidays. It was simply out of vogue in the United States for quite some time. I hope that helps. Fine, thank you. Yeah, Mark. 
just a comment on how powerful the connection is. Uh, two weeks ago, I was doing a Shiva Minyan at Shari Torah. Greg and I are both members. And we had 65 people from around the world supporting the sons in their grieving. And it just, there's this spiritual connection, even though it's online, that was really overwhelming and holy. I don't know how else to describe it. That's it. That's the barzel. That's the wall of steel that cannot, that cannot um, put a stop to powerful prayer when it is happening. And, and that, frankly, is, is, you know, in this particular time I found, and I found with my congregation and talking with my colleagues, that, like, it almost doesn't matter what prayers we're saying right now. The fact that we're not, we're, you know, in my congregation, we're not saying Baruchus and Chatzi Kaddishes, we are saying Mourner's Kaddish, um, doesn't matter to them um, over Zoom. What matters to them is they have the opportunity to see one another and, and, and say Shema together and to hear each other say Shema together and to see everybody have a private Amidah and to do um, a prayer for healing together. Those things, um, uh, I actually think they matter more now than ever. And I can't wait to experience what they feel like again when we go back in whatever phased way we go back into the physical space of our buildings. I think there will be a lot that is transformed in very good ways because of this experience. And I'm glad we will eventually get to leave this experience partially behind. I know, though for people who can't make it to synagogue in the fields, like this, that text is a good reminder of why a capacity like this needs to be available after we are back in synagogue, at least for certain people or certain parts or whatever it is, because the choices for everybody to not come to synagogue, we may learn, didn't have anything to do with whether or not they wanted to be in synagogue. A lot of it has to do with whether or not it's possible within the contours and constraints of their life, they could. And this would actually allow somebody to get into shul, this or whatever, whatever it is, um, for 15 or 20 minutes on a Shabbos morning before they go to work, because they have to work because they don't have flexibility with their schedule. Um, and uh, and I actually think those will be ways in which people's religious lives will grow, even if it looks different. Um, I don't think it should ever replace the synagogue by any means, um, not just because of my job, because I think we can't replace in-person um, uh, emo emotionally. It's just too, it's too hard. Rabbi, uh, do you think that this is going, that what you're proposing is going to change from the, the conservative movement? My, my daughter, who grew up under Rabbi Mark, uh, lives in, a, is in, a, in New Jersey in a very conservative synagogue, and I'm not going to name it, uh, but the, uh, the rabbi there is very proud to say that we're not having any electron, we're not connecting on Shabbos. And I don't know what you're going to say about my holiday is, but is this going, is this going to uh, engender uh, a, a lot of, she finds it, a, she finds it troubling. So you broke up a little bit. So I, I might, I might, uh, I, I might have missed a key okay. part of that question. I can repeat. Uh, my, my question is, uh, is this going to, uh, I mean, I, I really, you know, the technology has been good for me my, and my wife, and uh, we enjoy going to various services that we wouldn't have been to uh, around the country. That's kind of kind of fun. But there are synagogues, like my daughter's which is in, in New Jersey, where they have a, a it's very conservative ox, and the rabbi is a uh, piece. I guess is in his 50s, is, is uh, pretty proud that, and he's publicly, you know, declaimed to the board, according to my daughter, who is on the board, that, you know, we're not going to do any uh, any technology on Shabbos. And the question is, is this going to fundamentally change the movement, in your opinion? Um, so, I, I, the first thing I want to say is, um, there's not a movement uh, to be changed. Okay. And, I, and, I, 
and I mean that I mean that seriously. There, there, a, a movement is a large group of people with shared ideals and shared practices, practices moving towards a common goal. That has not been the case with conservative synagogues or institutions for a long, long time. Within the conservative ideology, there are probably about 20 different movements. So I'll just start there. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about Addis Israel as a movement in and of itself. And so we create shared goals around that. I, will it change, let's say, for conservative synagogues around the country, Shabbat life? Um, I don't think that it will. I really don't. I think that um, if anything, well, listen, in terms of how long this lasts and to what extent we can gather, I obviously, but let's say it's all over and things could go back to some reasonable gatherings can happen in a synagogue and I can put, let's say, 6,000 people on my property on Kol Nidre again. It, 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 let's say I could do that. I don't think there's any technology in the world that will keep people away from that experience if it's good enough. And so the, the key for conservative synagogues has always been within a population that does not see itself as obligated by God to move their bodies into the synagogue. Mm -hmm. Can it create a compelling enough content-based, emotionally-based service such that people can't imagine being somewhere else unless they don't have a choice, like the compelled person? Um, so for a synagogue in New Jersey that's not using technology um, because that's the choice that the community thinks is best for them and they are able to keep their people connected to one another and to the rabbi in other ways uh, and keep the money coming in, the cash flow coming in such that they can pay their employees, which I, I just wonder how all that is working out. But let's for that community, um, I, I think that they will, God willing, get to exist as they have. I do think the high holidays will cause challenges for those who want to stay offline. I don't think you can retain a synagogue membership in 2020 without providing high holiday services on those days. And if large groups can't gather and multiple small groups is impossible because who could ever decide who gets to come and who doesn't, mm. unless you're a small enough synagogue that everybody gets, you know, unless you can figure out how everybody who wants to can, there's no actual way to start breaking up the synagogue into smaller communities and letting them in the building um, without, you know, excluding people or excluding worse off demographics. There would be the first, the first group to not be allowed in would be those over whatever age is deemed the most vulnerable at that particular point. Sounds to me like a cruel solution. Um, but I know people are thinking through how will this work. If that's the case, they will have to off, they will just have to find a way to offer it. Maybe they'll do home things or, I don't know what it is, but something will have to happen. Um, in general, I don't think the, I don't think conservative synagogues well, I think most will be better off. Most will have the technology and the skill now to meet a lot of people during the week where they need to be met. They will do what we have been doing for years, which is live streaming our services so that people who are homebound can say Kaddish, can participate in our services, can feel like they're still part of the community. It has mattered deeply. So, that I, I, you know, every B'nai Mitzvah that I have, I get emails from around the world family members who would have otherwise never seen it because we don't video record them mm. um, because that's different than live streaming according to Jewish mm. law. The, they are grateful that they have been able, like their hearts are expanded because of what is being provided. And I'm not interested in governing what people do in their homes on Shabbat or otherwise, unless it's harming other people, which this technology does not. <laughs> So I, I don't, I, it, I, I'm just gonna be so fascinated to see what happens. The, the big answer is we don't really know. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a Kashrut question if I may, Rabbi. When I, when I shop in stores, I see uh, products that are labeled and uh, certified vegetarian, but they're not, they don't have a hexer. We don't buy them. Is it okay to buy them? Is it okay to take them into the house? Well, that is a loaded question. So, um, uh, I, I, so I, you know, I generally try to answer this question according, specifically according to people's lives and observances. If what you're asking me is, will I be eating trape if I eat one of these products? I will tell you that um, you will end up eating trape if you buy only Hexard products. 
So it, that can't be the question. Um, there is no Heckscher that is 100% foolproof. I know this because I worked in that world and I have done a lot of supervision uh, in my life. Uh, I, I have investigated a lot of foods. And the reason that Kashrut companies, if you subscribe to them, send out alerts daily about products that have been mislabeled or have had this, that, or the other found in is because, it, it, right, the, the Kashrut industry is run by humans and we are fallible. So I prefer to consider things kosher, not based on the symbol, but the ingredients and the, and the processing of them. That is becoming harder and harder because the nature of food processing is, is harder and harder to trace. And the, the things that go into food now didn't exist 50 years ago because science has progressed and we can do things uh, that we weren't able to do before. In my experience, um, the very best way to determine whether or not something has in it what you don't want to heat is to check with allerg is allergens. What most companies are worried about more than anything else is their liability. And so labeling practices have become very strict and internally strict so that, you know, I, I now know if something may have been processed in a plant that may have processed shellfish, just because if I have a shellfish allergy, I know that I probably won't buy that product depending on what it is. Does that mean that the food was ever in contact with shellfish? It, it means almost definitely not because of the way the wording is. Um, so for this, I wanna say like, it depends on what kind of home you are trying to create with your kashrut. Every food item is possible to find out whether or not if there's cross contamination. Um, vegetarian label is usually pretty good in this country. A vegan label is pretty good in this country. A gluten-free label was good and actually quite helpful for Pesach this year for people who didn't have access to all the kinds of products. There are certain gluten-free products that, you know, were actually, um, were good and worked really well on Pesach. The gluten-free certification is pretty strict and is uh, largely in line with Jewish law, um, thank God. So the answer is, yeah, most of those products you're holding that say vegetarian are probably kosher. And um, if the allergens on there don't cause you concern, you absolutely can have them in your home and your home will still be kosher, but you will no longer have an only hectured home. And that's a choice that only you could make. What is the value of having an only hectured food home? And that's totally up to you and who maybe you bring into your home. Um, you know, and, and I remember in rabbinical school, my roommate and I had this fight over hectured or not hectured. Kosher home was a given, but would it be an only hectured home? And he said, you know, halfway through the, he was like, I want it to be all hectured. I want anybody to be able to eat here. And I said, well, who have you had over thus far that would have cared? Which is to say, are we keeping this only hectured home for the hypothetical community that you have or your actual community? And then we started bringing in kosher non hectured items. I won. <laughs> our, our, rabbi, our, our rabbi is Adam Wahlberg, and he said that uh, we, we can take in frozen pure vegetables, you know, like peas, frozen peas, for example, that don't have a hexure. Yes, for sure. Just to give you an for idea. Sure. Yeah, yeah, anything like that. So we do. We take that in, even without a hexure. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? I live in an assisted living facility that's kosher. It's run by the CJE. They have a mishkiach who claims that you cannot have asparagus. And yet, uh, one of the big kosher restaurants, Shallots, serves uh, asparagus. They cut the uh, tops off. But how about frozen asparagus? Is that considered non-kosher as well? So let, I, I want asparagus is, is very much um, uh, fine. The problem with asparagus is that um, the bugs are hard to get out. That's it. The bugs, it, the bugs are hard to get out. So a restaurant has to decide whether or not they are willing to put in the effort to wash them um, sufficiently and um, my guess is if they're cutting off the heads, the mashkiach is lying to them and telling them it's impossible to get the bugs out, which it is absolutely not. 
or they don't want to put the time into it because that is not a good use of their staff. Uh, but um, I eat asparagus in my home and I have a kosher home and I just wash them and then I don't eat bugs, which is, which is the key. So, um, but this is the kosher industry is a, is a tough one because what wins in the kosher industry for the kosher consumer is how strict can you be? And um, it's almost once, once a, a hashkacha uh, becomes more strict, it's almost, in, it's almost impossible to reverse it, to become more lenient again. That has been the case for Jewish life in a whole number of areas. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to turn back from those barriers. So, so I, I understand why people decide I'm just not gonna do it with asparagus. It takes too much time or I don't know if I can get them out. But, um, and cutting the heads off to me seems like taking the only part of the asparagus that's worth eating off. <laughs> that's personal though. <laughs> well, they tell me that supposedly broccoli and cauliflower uh, are in the same system as asparagus, yet we have broccoli and, and cauliflower all the time. It, it all depends on infestations and what crops might be going through infestation, infestations at any time. So three years ago, they, they, they basically said you can't uh, have strawberries in any of your establishments because there was an infestation in one part of the country with strawberries. And so instead of allowing people to cut the tops off or whatever it was, they just said, we can't, you know, we, we, we don't have the time to supervise this right now. So no more strawberries. That's how it goes, I guess. <laughs> uh, we, we have strawberries all the time. <laughs> Good. This is the season. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? You got the text in the chat there. You see the text sheet that came up? Yes. Okay. There's a second great text. I didn't teach it, but another time um, uh, that, uh, that you have now in case uh, you want to you wanna look at it. And somewhere on the Addis Facebook page, Rabbi Holtzblatt and that, my, my co-senior rabbi, she and I taught this text, the second one, the second page of the text. Uh, it was about a week ago uh, in, one, in one of our, uh, in one of our, you know, we teach every day um, live. So, uh, so enjoy. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. I'm really always um, honored to be able to participate with, with that. Yashikoff. Thank you, Yasha Koch. Thank you, Rabbi, for participating. Thank you all for participating. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you all again soon. We are running many webinars. Go to FJMC slash webinars, you'll get a complete list. Also, there, there are uh, sites to recording sessions. So this, for example, this one is being recorded and will be added to uh, that list. And we see Norm joining just as we're, we're saying goodbye. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you very much, all. Have a good day. Thank you, Rabbi. Of course. Thank you again, Rabbi. Take care. Bye -bye.